Hey, it's Sam Patrick Regan here from Kintsugi Hope, coming from uh, Elam Church in Chelmsford, Life Church, and where God lives. And uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be speaking to you at the Elam Leaders Summit. And, uh, and we're going to be doing two talks. The first talk is going to be called Leading When You're Not Okay. And the second one is going to be Where Faith and Mental Health Meet. These are absolutely crucial topics to um, where we are as a society at the moment. So I really hope they're going to encourage you. Um, I have to admit, um, I've spoken in this church um, quite a few times, but never by myself. So um, it's a bit of a strange experience, but I know there's going to be lots of people watching. So I'm going to try my best to give you as much energy and passion as if this place was absolutely rammed. And uh, so I really hope that this will be a, a, a really inspirational session for you. All the teaching over these next two sessions will come from, I guess, two of the books that I've written. I've written five books. Um, the first one, um, Honesty Over Silence, which is, says it's okay not to be okay. And particularly this session um, is looking at a lot of the principles that we learn in there. And uh, When Faith Gets Shaken, Where Is God When Suffering Happens? And uh, we've reduced these and put them on our website to try and help people at this time. Um, and if you get them from us, then all the money goes back into the charity to help people with their emotional mental health. Um, if you get it from a very big website, which we won't mention its name, beginning with A, um, we don't seem to get much of it so, or any of it. So do check those out if you want to. Um, and maybe actually get one for someone who's going through a tough time. Um, leading when you're not okay. I wanted to share a little bit of my story I actually grew up in this church, and it's a very special place to me. And, uh, and when I was 16, I went and did a mission in London. And uh, it's one of these two-week things where you sort of spend the two weeks sleeping on an airbed and going out, doing sort of outreach during the day. But there were a couple of nights that really, really, really moved me. Um, one night, I was at a place called Cardboard City which those of you may remember, back in the day, it was underneath um, the Royal Festival Hall, and there were hundreds and hundreds of homeless people there. And, uh, and I remember um, sitting in a circle with a bunch of homeless guys, and uh, one guy had been begging all day, and he'd got enough money for a hamburger, and he took a bite out of the hamburger, and he passed it around the circle. And each homeless person took a bite out of it, and then he handed it to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? I'm sharing with me. I have everything. I'm from a nice place at um, Chompsford, go to a great church in Elam. What are you doing sharing with me? And I remember looking up uh, on the wall of Cardboard City, and someone with big red paint had written the words, welcome to reality. Welcome to reality. And I remember that day, I went back and laid on my airbed, and I said a prayer that changed my life. God, I want to see the world the way that you see it. I want to capture your heart for the things uh, that where it's broken. I want to be involved in your uh, mission to go to the most uh, marginalized and the lost and the last and the least. And, um, and so when I moved back here, we started doing lots of mission activity here at the church, which was amazing. But then when I was 18, I moved to Peckham, where Only Fools and Horses um, was meant to be based, though they filmed most of it in Bristol, which we are very unhappy about for those of us that lived in Peckham. And Peckham um, was amazing. It was an incredible place. It was the only place I knew where you could buy half a goat and a mobile phone in the same shop. It was brilliant. And uh, it was just vibrant and culturally so diverse. I, I absolutely fell in love with the place. But I guess while I was there, I started working with some really disenfranchised young people. And I saw the effects of poor mental health close up. And uh, I remember one of the toughest staff meetings I did at the charity I founded and started called XLP um, was when a 15-year-old girl had completed a suicide in a school. And, uh, and it was almost like this girl had just started to engage with us. And like, if she'd engaged with us earlier, maybe we could have done something. And then I was living down the road from where a young kid called Damalola Taylor lived. Um, he was uh, only, I think he was 10, when someone put a bottle in his leg and he bled to death in a stairwell on Peckham. And I remember I'm um, watching the walk that he did home from his school, because uh, it was the same walk I used to do home from work. 
And, uh, and I remember going to memorial services. Uh, there was a time where there were so many knife crime deaths and I went to memorial service after memorial service. So I remember one precious lady, um, I walked into the memorial service. Her son had been killed. Um, he'd, he'd died um, of infection because the knife that was used on him um, was dirty. It took him three weeks to die. And she said, you sit on the front row. And on the front row were all the other grieving families. And, uh, and she said, you're one of us now. And, uh, and I remember just thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not sure I can handle this. And feeling selfish for thinking that as well. Because obviously I hadn't been through the pain that they'd been through. And then, um, because I wanted to learn about cross-cultural communication, living in Peckham, uh, I travelled a lot. I went to Ghana, I went to Kosovo a year after the war or Kosovo, as they prefer, um, it's main, the, the, that's the way you're meant to say it, um, India, um, Hong Kong, all sorts of different places. And, uh, and I just saw the effects of poverty close up. And, uh, and then I went to Trenchtown. Trenchtown in Jamaica is one of my favourite places on earth. I love the people there. But we went to this memorial, and uh, the memorial is for children who were lost in the violence that happened in this inner city communion. Uh, community, and I want you to uh, watch 30 seconds of this of me just outside this memorial. Check this out. I'm uh, at this memorial. It says, "In memory of children killed under tragic and violent circumstances." And if you look around the memorial, there's just lists of names of kids that have been killed. It's horrible. Anyone dies at any age, but like seriously, four, four. Harvey, age one. Unidentified naught. You know, the reason I show this and tell these stories is because during this time, I did not process what was going on for me. So in the book, When Faith Gets Shaken, um, which tells a time of when I went through lots of health issues, uh, my wife wrote a chapter called Secondhand Smoke. And the whole idea is secondhand smoke can still kill you. And I guess sometimes as a leader, you are spinning so many plates. You're trying to be all things to all people. Um, and for some of us, we have this uh, big sense of responsibility, which uh, is really important. But actually, we don't realize that all those experiences we go through, if we don't process them properly, then actually they're going to really affect us. And we need to learn how to process that. And, uh, and these issues that I was facing as a leader, I knew they were just too big for me. And I knew I'm not the rescuer. I'm not Jesus. I can't rescue anyone. Only Jesus can rescue people. But I guess because I had a big heart and the need was there, I wanted to try. And I guess I just burn out trying and um and i remember 2011 and i know the london riots hit that went all over the country and i was doing loads of tv and media stuff and um politicians um were getting in touch i think i met every uh, well-known politician within a week surprise surprise and uh, really trying to bring a sense of hope and then you get clobbered by friendly fire um some christians going oh saw you on telly you didn't mention god and i was like well i was asked about knives and, uh, and, like, and, it, and it really hurts, actually, after a while, because you're putting yourself out there, and it becomes really, really difficult. I guess, for me, as a leader, though, when it really, really um, hit home was when um, my health started to deteriorate, and my family, and I got diagnosed with a degenerative knee condition, which meant I need to get both my legs broken in um, three places, a big external frame <laughs> put around my leg, and uh, you can probably see a photograph of it coming up there. And it was really hard. It was hard for me, but it was also hard for the family. And life to me seemed like a bit like a game of Tetris. Do you remember Tetris? Um, Tetris is that game that some of us of a certain age played a lot of when we were kids. It's when different blocks fall out of the sky and uh, you need to rotate them and you need to get them in a straight line. And when you get them in a straight line, the line disappears. Um, but then they just keep coming and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they go faster and faster, and eventually, it's game over. And I felt like that was my life. This is one of my favorite slides. You've probably seen speakers use this a lot before. My plan, <laughs> and the reality of life. Up and down, it is a challenge. And you know, and when you're leading, 
you know, that sense of I just got to keep going is more. I guess I was that classic Christian worker where basically if you get your phone and you charge it for 10%, your phone will work just as well on 10% as it does 100%. It just doesn't last very long. And, uh, and I think that's the challenge, isn't it? Is so many of us live on 10%. And, uh, and you go to the Facebook reel, you know, I've been doing it this week with the whole coronavirus and thinking, oh my goodness, some churches, um, some leaders look like they're doing amazing. And you start playing top trumps with pain and top trumps um, with how well you're doing. And so the thing about Facebook actually and social media is people that post on there, it's, it's brilliant, you know, in many ways, but often you post the highlights, the show reel. Um, it came to a... Um, a real headline with me is when I, was, um, I had a, um, a visit from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I hope you caught those names as they dropped there. And, uh, and they came, and uh, there were all these photos. Um, this is my wife, actually, with the um, Duchess of Cambridge. And, uh, and it's quite amusing. This photograph, um, the Duchess of Cambridge has just turned to Diane and said, do you like my dress? I'm not sure what you meant to say when the Duchess of Cambridge says, do you like my dress? And, uh, and so Diane's going, yeah, it's a really nice dress. And, uh, and she was like, oh, that's good. William says, I look like a tablecloth. And uh, I sort of looked at him and was like, yeah, I can sort of see his point. But we came to say goodbye. And I was standing on the steps of All Hallows with the Duke and Duchess. And uh, there was all these photographers just going off everywhere. And, uh, and I turned to Catherine and I said, I'm not sure how you do this. This is so intense. And... Uh, and I remember going home that night, and we were in OK Magazine, Hello Magazine, magazines in Sweden I've never heard of, and uh, literally these photos went around the world, and everyone was texting me going, Patrick, wow, you're doing really well. The reality is, in that photograph, I'm a leader, burnt out, stressed out, suffering from anxiety, and not really knowing who I can talk to, because I felt ashamed. And so I started thinking, you know, what are all the decent sermons I'd heard on burnout and mental health particularly, and when your mental health starts to deteriorate. And I started thinking, you know, I remember hearing a sermon saying anxiety was not trusting God enough, that depression was a sin. And, uh, and I got prayed for healing so many times for my legs that I started to feel like, oh my goodness, God doesn't care about me as much as he cares about everyone else. In fact, I started feeling sorry for the people who were praying for healing for me because they were praying so passionately um, and nothing was happening. I thought I might just, you know, fall over just to cheer them up a little bit. I felt like it was my fault. And I don't know how, as a leader, and, um, you know, and whether you're a leader in a church or a leader in your family or a leader in community, you know, it's a massive broad term, isn't it? But, but these phrases, I should, I must, I ought. I should be able to cope. What's wrong with me? I've got a family to look after, a team to lead, a job I'm passionate about. I must pull myself together. I ought to be stronger. Get a grip. Spend more time praying. And so I wrote this book. Um, I find writing for me is very therapeutic. It saves on the therapy bills as well. And, uh, and I wrote it, and there were many times I thought, I need to stop writing this, because every time um, someone reads it, they're going to think I'm backslidden or something. But I wrote it because actually I'm fed up with the show. I'm fed up of pretending everything is okay, and I'm desperate for something more real, more authentic. And as I wrote it, and uh, those days I felt like giving up, I went to the Psalms, and I realized that 40% of the Psalms are laments. They're David crying out to God, God, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust in you anyway. And, uh, and actually, I think in this period of time, um, and, uh, and when lockdown is eased and memorial services can start to happen, um, people want to remember um, people that they've, they've loved so much. We need to do lament really well. We need to allow people to grieve well. That is one of the things that's been taken away from people at this time. It's so important. But I didn't want to just tell my story. I told my friend's story, Rach. Rach Wright. Um, she has a son with a life-limiting condition. He's turned every couple of hours, 20 injections a day. I was like, Rach, how? You know, she's a leader in the church, and she was, and she does amazing things in the community. How do you cope? And she said, it's really, really hard. It is really hard. But faith for her keeps her going. Um, John Sutherland, senior borough commander, he's a leader of 1,500 police officers. And uh, he's also one of my best mates. And uh, I remember many years ago, he was down A&E. 
and I was scared he'd been stabbed or something, but the reality was, um, the Tetris moment, he just, had, he just got too much, and he'd, he'd crashed, he'd had an anxiety attack, and, uh, and that changed the course of his life. And then there's another chapter by my precious friends, Alan and Jackie Slough, again, leaders in the church. Um, when you're leading that situation, and their 16-year-old son completed a suicide, and, uh, and I was like, why do you wanna write a chapter? And they were like, do you know what? Six and a half thousand people complete suicides every single year. Not talking about this isn't doing us any good. And so I realized that as a leader, that actually it sometimes uh, means that we need to be vulnerable in order to allow others to be vulnerable. And the reaction we've had from the book, and we've done a DVD and the tours, and, and just the whole thing has just been incredible. People's stories are incredible. And I think it boils down to this. I think the reason we don't talk about stuff is we feel ashamed. And shame and guilt can be two very different things. Shame is, I'm wrong. Guilt is, I've done something wrong. Brene Brown, who's done some amazing work on this, says, shame has two voices. Who do you think you are? And you're not enough. Shame loves silence, secrecy, and judgment. And on your worst days, it can feel like, I think everyone would be better off if I wasn't here. But then she goes on, the way you step out of shame is to own your story and to realize that actually some of the things that you're going through isn't weakness, um, it's just what you're going through. When I was writing the chapter on anxiety, um, I like a good definition, and, uh, and I found this, and I think it's absolutely beautiful. Kirsten Corley said this, more than anything else, anxiety is caring. It's never wanting to hurt someone's feelings. It's never wanting to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the want and the need to be accepted and like. So you try too hard sometimes. You try too hard sometimes. There's another guy, um, Tim Katma. He wrote a book called Depressive Illness, The Curse of the Strong. He said nine times out of ten, he can tell the characteristics of someone that is suffering depression. And he described them as these. Moral strength, reliability, Diligence, strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, vulnerable to criticism, self-esteem, dependent on the evaluation of others. People that struggled with this? Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill. I realised that people that struggle with anxiety and depression, panic attacks, are not weak people, they're just people that have been strong for too long. So there was an image um, that got me through. And the image is an image of kintsugi. Kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. What happens if I get a bowl and I break it at home, I tend to mend it with superglue. And the whole idea of superglue is you hide the cracks, right? And, uh, and you pretend it's okay. What they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique. And so after leading a charity for all that time, we decided, me and Diane, uh, for 22 years leading XLP, it was time to do something else. And we felt this image of beauty coming from brokenness, which is incredibly biblical um, in so many different places that we could read in the New Testament about jars of clay and, and all sorts of other things uh, in the writings of Paul and in the way that Jesus dealt with the broken as well, is we decided that actually Kintsugi Hope was going to be born. This is a, a little video of us uh, having a go at doing the whole Kintsugi thing with me and my precious friend, Hannah. Check this out. My youngest son, Nathaniel, was at a friend's house. There was a confrontation with a boy that turned up and decided that he'd take a knife and stab Nathaniel with it. I feel like at that time I was in a bubble and feeling alone and not even knowing how to articulate that to anyone. I had to have major limb reconstruction surgery. Around the same time, my daughter got a condition called HSP and my dad got cancer. It was like a perfect storm of things going wrong. And I realised that the anxiety was really taking root in my life. And then you realise that actually you can't just carry on and you need to show some self-compassion. Bereavement is different for everyone. What's really important is that people are able to talk to someone that they can connect with. And through that, there's a real good healing process. 
and actually maybe receiving help is letting go of your pride and saying I am really broken and as we share in our brokenness we share in our common humanity. The brokenness is my heart and it's in pieces but through time it's starting to come together again. Uh, Kintsugi Hope, um, you can see I've got my Kintsugi Hope t-shirt on, um, discovering treasure in life's scars, and uh, uh, we've got loads of these if you are interested in them. Um, so there's a couple of things that I want to say um, to leaders that I think could really help us w- leading when you're not okay, and the first one is this, and um, courage and vulnerability are the same thing. The Latin word for courage, Brené Brown says, is cur. It means to speak your mind with your heart, to show up and let your true self be seen. That everything that involves courage involves vulnerability. Um, Brené Brown says this, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, joy, courage, empathy and creativity. It's the source of hope, empathy, accountability and authenticity. If you want greater clarity in your purpose or deeper or more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. And, you know, that means we need to admit to what's going on. You know, here we are, 2 Corinthians. Paul, I love this passage um, in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, you can see, like, throughout the passage here, um, the first uh, sort of eight verses are about comfort and being in distress. And then it gets to verse 8, and Paul says this, we do not want you to be ill-informed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we're, facing, we're experienced in the province of Asia. We're under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. And you know, here he is, and you know in other places, it talks about that he's been shipwrecked, he's been this, he's been that, and he's saying, you know what, I don't want you to be ill-informed. It's okay not to be okay and uh, and it's okay to communicate some of that stuff you know people don't always connect with your success stories they connect with your scars Simon Barrington who is the chair of Kintsugi Hope wrote a book called Leading the Millennial Way looking at what are millennials looking for in leaders and the three top things that millennials are looking for in leaders are passion humility and integrity you lead well because of your vulnerability not despite of it Don't be afraid of being a weak leader who reveals a strong God. Courage and vulnerability are the same thing. Second thing, acceptance and resignation are very different things. Now, um, I think this is really, really interesting. Um, When we were writing the Kintsugi Hope course, um, when we got to the week on resilience, um, we looked at what is resilience and what isn't resilience. And uh, Di, my wife, did this fascinating uh, piece of research where um, Harvard Business Review and other people had looked at how you survive a concentration camp. And what they noticed was, was the optimists died very, very soon. We'll be out of here by next week. It's all going to be okay. It's all going to be all right. I heard loads of people saying that when the coronavirus started. And I felt a little bit of a, a prophet of doom going, you know what, guys? Actually, I think social distancing could last 12 months. I think, you know, we've got the winter flu coming. Um, And I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I think we've got to accept this is going to be a tough time for people. And there's going to be lots of highs and there's going to be lots of lows. And I think we also need to accept that optimism and hope are very different things. Now, I'm obviously not saying don't be optimistic, but I'm saying we can't live in denial. We have to accept what is going on. The people in the concentration camps that accepted the reality Um, And then what they did is they found almost like meaning and purpose in it. They started doing some music. They started um, all sorts of different things to to try and give back. They found a level of contentment in the concentration camps that others didn't. Obviously, they didn't want to be there. Obviously, that was like like a given. But actually, they actually lived part of their lives so much happier than those who were like, it's all going to be over. It's all going to be okay. And uh, they found purpose. Um, uh, Desmond Tutu says this. We're meant to live in joy. This does not mean that life will be easy or painless. It means that we turn our faces to the wind and accept that this is a storm we must pass through. We cannot succeed by denying what exists. The acceptance of reality is the only place in which change can begin. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 
is one of the most misquoted passages in Scripture, and I'm sure um, you're aware <laughs> of this. And uh, because it's written um, in the context of the people of Israel being in exile, right? They're, they're, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had taken them into Babylon, and uh, they felt orphaned, they felt abandoned. We know that the book of Lamentations describes their sadness. They felt like aliens in a foreign land. There was no Levitical sacrifices. Yahweh wasn't worshipped in the same way. Um, they were absolutely um, desolated. And then Hananiah comes along in Jeremiah 28 and goes, you know what? It's all going to be okay. It's going to be over in two years. And that's a pretty, not a bad prophecy. And I think Jeremiah probably would have gone along with that. You know, that would have been a really good prophecy to have. But the reality is, Jeremiah 29 is written by Jeremiah going, you know what, guys? It's a false prophecy. It's not going to be two years. It's going to be 70 years. But this time is not to be wasted. Plant gardens, settle down, pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city. For I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you future and hope. And so the hope in that context is bigger. It's actually bigger than what a lot of people would say. And also, the key thing about that passage is it's not written to an individual. That verse is not about your career path. I know we pray over people at baptisms and uh, when they go off to university, and that's cool, but actually it was written to a community. The you in that passage is you plural, you all. I've got plans to press for you. Isn't that beautiful, actually, that God is talking to a community, and I believe that God is talking to a community right now. You know, my thing for leaders, um, don't just carry on saying that once this project is over, after this funding bid is done, after this book is written, it will be okay. What you're actually doing is developing damaging habits and pushing yourself too hard. Do not be ashamed for asking for help. Struggling doesn't mean you failed, it means you're a human being. A third key thing for me for leaders is realizing that self-compassion and self-indulgence are two different things. Who do you think your biggest critic is? Now, if you're involved in any sort of leadership, you will know that trying to please people um, is pretty hard. The music's too loud, the music's too quiet, the music's too long, the music's not long enough, um, the preaching's too long, the preaching's not funny enough. You know, it just goes on and on. Um, you're not pastoral enough, you're too evangelistic, you're not evangelistic enough, and you're just like, oh my goodness. But you know the biggest critic is? It's me. It's you. It's the self-critic, isn't it? Um, and I've started to realize that I can't keep beating myself up. In fact, I've, you know, I've often said that, you know, doing this film for you guys at Elam, I could um, watch this back, and I probably won't, to be honest, because I'll go, oh my goodness, Patrick, you could have said that a lot better. You could have communicated that a bit clearer. You could have done this, used that illustration. What was wrong with you? And the inner critic will go into overdrive. I've realized that I need to show myself a little bit more self-compassion. Self-compassion is not the extra glass of wine, isn't six episodes of your favorite box set on Netflix, isn't more food. I'm um, actually self-compassion is this, is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. How would you treat a friend who is struggling? You'd probably treat them with encouragement, understanding, empathy, patience, gentleness. We tell ourselves we wouldn't dream of telling someone else. Compassion actually means to suffer with, to be conscious of another's pain and distress. So we need to develop the safety net as leaders. For me, and my safety net is, I need to exercise. I, on lockdown, I just went down to decathlon and bought a bike. And I was like, I, I don't got a lot of money, but I'm just going to buy a bike because I know I need to get out. Um, I can't run because of my knees, so I read music. Um, get a peer mentor. Get an older mentor who's more experienced than you. Um, community, prayer triplets. Um, you know, I've realized I need to watch more football, which is really tough, you know. But I know that when it comes back, it's going to be one of those stress reliefs. Having a day off, we all talk about it, but we don't always action it. The last couple of things, developing resilience. Um, Alan Scott said this, the future doesn't long belong to the brilliant, <laughs> but the resilient. Not to those who avoid scars or pain, but to the wounded healers who choose to give again. Resilience is thriving in the midst of adversity. One of the key things that we can have as leaders is that self-awareness, being aware of some of the trigger points. Um, Martin Silman, a psychologist, um, said that when you're looking at resilience and when you've really been knocked down and you're not okay, there are three P's, he calls them, um, that stunt our recovery. And I recognize these in myself as a leader. Number one 
he talks about personalization, the belief that we're always at fault. I'm always at fault for everything. Um, we've already mentioned this, putting ourselves under a, a pressure that we wouldn't dream of putting anyone else under. And pervasiveness, this is a really interesting one. The belief that an event will affect every area of your life. Now, the whole coronavirus has affected massive areas of our lives, but it hasn't affected every area of our lives. Um, we've got friends. Um, some of us may have lost family, but we may have other family. Um, we've got homes. Um, most of us are, have actually got enough food. And it hasn't affected every area of our lives, but it's affected a massive part of our lives. So the belief that every area will affect our, every area of our life, getting rid of that, and then permanence. Telling ourselves that things will never get better. I think healthy doubt is okay. It's okay to say, actually use the word sometimes and maybe. And to grow from a, um, f- to change from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And then um, he says, hurrying through his talk, <laughs> the, the one I wanted to mention, um, uh, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Um, a famous quote by Dallas Willard, hurry is the greatest enemy of our spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I don't know. I think this is harder than ever now. Did you know that iPhone users touch his or her phone 2,617 times a day? And I bet on lockdown, it's almost double that. Each user is on her phone for two and a half hours, over 76 sessions. John Mark Comer, who's done a brilliant book on this, says, if there is a secret to happiness, it's simple, present to the moment. The more present we are now, the more joy we tap into. I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what does success look like? For me, I've come to the conclusion that success is living by my values. It's living by what's important for me. I, I finish with this. This is um, the sixth point, living for an audience of one. Um, years ago now, we had a visit um, by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I hope you caught that name as it dropped. And uh, he came to visit a lot of our young people and what we were doing. And, uh, and it's a very long story, but I won't tell it all. But there was a time when me and Desmond Tutu, we were on our own. And uh, we were sitting on our community bus. And Desmond Tutu said to me, you know, one thing you need to remember, Patrick, is this. You make God smile. And I told that story a lot of times. And every time I told it, I lied. You're like, what? Pause. Pause, pause the tape. He's a liar. Yeah. I lied. I said that XLP make God smile, which was the charity I used to run. But Desmond Tutu never said that. He said, you make God smile. Because again, I had to realize that actually I didn't want to receive God's love for me. I always wanted other people to benefit. Um, my daughter, Abby, she's got some additional needs. And, uh, and so um, we always go to her assembly. And it's really interesting with kids and the assembly, isn't it? And if you're going to see your kids at an assembly, what happens is all the kids come in and they start looking for their parents. And when they look for their parents, they all do this. And then you look around and all the parents are going as well. It's really cool. And Abby, because she has some eyesight issues, she has a condition called nystagmus, she struggles to find us. But when she sees my eyes, she suddenly relaxes and settles down. And I thought, you know, I need to live for an audience of one. I need to live for the fact that I make God smile. If we go back to that image in Trenchtown I showed you at the start of the talk, um, I went away from that image. That was probably one of the most harrowing days of my life. I went, God, where are you? And then I remember back to this image, this huge face with huge tears running down it. And I realized that God suffers with, that God is with us. You know, if you take your Bibles and you go to that famous passage in Psalm 23, you look at verses 1 to 3 and all life is good. You know, life is fantastic. And then you get to verse 4 and it talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And then interestingly, after verse 4, life doesn't just go back to being fantastic again. Um, It talks about, um, you're laying a table now before me in the presence of my enemies. We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Things change. And in this time as leaders, things can't go back to the way they were. Um, I think it's fascinating what is going on. I think there's a mixture of beauty and real heartache, and we've got to hold the tension between those two things. I think we have to be careful in the way that we communicate. You know, a lot of people have been using the word, what a great opportunity for the gospel, and I sort of get it, 
but actually people are dying. And, uh, and so our language is important. We need to be sensitive, but at the same time, guiding people to a saviour that loves them and cares for them. I finish with this quote from Henry Nguyen, who is uh, one of my heroes. He says this, Nobody escapes being wounded. We're all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how do we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put the woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we become wounded healers. I want to thank you for staying with me. Um, I hope that you'll watch the other talk um, as we're going to start grappling with how as churches we can reach out in the whole area of emotional and mental health and well-being and, and what the church can do at this moment to respond. Um, but I want to say thank you to you. Um, I want to say thank you for leading, um, whether that's your church, leading your family, um, the community, um, for all the things that you do and no one said thank you. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of youth work and I can count the times on one hand that a young person came up to me going, oh, thank you, that, you must have spent ages preparing that talk. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I want you to leave you with the thought, um, you make God smile. You make God smile. I'm going to pray. Um, please get in touch with us at Kintsugi Hope. Um, do check out the resources on the website. Um, we'd love to um, have a connection with you guys. Father God, thank you for every single person watching this. And I pray, God, that they would know today that they make God smile, that you love them and that you care for them and you long to um, see them flourish, Lord God, in a time of adversity. In Jesus' name, amen.